So uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you the world top crypto anarchist, smuggler. Frank Brown. Jim Bell. Paul Rosenberg. And New York Potter. We also should have here Amir, but Amir is lost somewhere. So it seems our our, our panel discussion will be probably a bit more shorter. <laughs> anyway, so I prepared a lot of questions for you guys. Uh, each question is related to you, to your project or your center or your your project. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, I would like to introduce your project, and then I would like to ask the others. What, 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 what do they think about the given project? Okay, so uh, a few years ago, Paul Rosenberg wrote a very important book. And the, the name of this book is Lodging of Wafering Man. And in this book, he described the system gamma. It's basically the, the universal sharing economy system or application which support cryptocurrencies. Paul, in that time, he predicted cryptocurrencies like, like Bitcoin with a lot of interesting features, like, for example, in integrated insurance for sellers, allowing all people to offer any services or products to anyone without the government possibility to regulate or to shut out the system. So what he did, he basically described the peer-to-peer -peer society where anyone could offer any kind of service or product to anyone, making the, making the government obsolete. A few, uh, few years after uh, this book, Amir Taki wrote the proof of the concept of fully decentralized market, showing that something like this is technically feasible. Now we have a very prospective project like Open Bazaar or Particle. So I have multiple questions for you. So if you think you know the answer, answer, just answer. The first question is, do you believe this system will exist in the future and when? Well, the system is already partly in existence. Um, we have obviously open bazaar systems like that we there are decentralized dark markets that, that do much of this but they really need to be i mean they're partly centralized dark markets they need to be decentralized um we have currency we have encryption uh, a lot of pieces of it are in place already uh when it gets to a full a full system that's a very good question but it's coming faster than i could have guessed uh you know i remember back in the 1990s when I began really getting involved in these things, to have a meeting like this with hundreds of people that are, that are involved, that understand, that get it, that want to build new things. My God, this is a dream. I, I'm serious. I mean, with, who would have believed that this would have happened? But here we are. So the exciting thing for me right now is that there are so many thousands of people who get up every day and say, I want to build something really cool with cryptocurrencies and the crypto economy. That, to me, is the thing that makes this really important. Because we have Bitcoin. We have now other cryptocurrencies. And we're kind of building around it. Bitcoin alone is not enough. It's a great start, but it can't do everything. So we have a specialized currency. We probably shouldn't call some of these currencies. We shouldn't call them all coins. You know, you can use different kinds of uh, cryptocurrency sort of things to use for insurance, for different certificates for various things. There's all sorts of ways, applications this can be done, and it's not just currency anymore. They're trust technologies. And so we have Bitcoin and we can build all these pieces around it. And there are all these thousands of people who are interested in building new things. And we can build a full 
crypto economy that's going to be very difficult for anybody to stop. You never say impossible because who knows? But it's going to be very difficult to stop. And we're, we're a good piece of the way there. And I suspect that it will continue building. Um, there will be bad days. There will be good days. Uh, but I think it will continue building. And unless we get real Stalinism on a very broad scale, it will exist. I'd like to comment um, actually on a more meta level, mm -hmm. not about uh, the gamma existence, but actually about your book. Oh, you. And I think that your book shows that uh, fiction, vision, and narratives are really important. It's not enough to, to live on white papers. You know, sometimes you have to have a vision of where you're going to. You know, you, you, you kind of have to tell stories to yourself. So, in my opinion, and for me personally, um, your book was an inspiration, not from the text side, but more of um, having a dream side. And there are many people in, in, in our scene, whatever you call it, that might not be programmers, that might not be mathematicians or whatever, but I actually believe that there are lots of artists and a lot of writers and so on. And I think that the work of writers and artists in helping us prepare um, a free culture is actually um, really, really big. We need the help of artists and writers so we can dream more than just bits and bytes. I also want to... Um, does it work? Okay, it works. Um, I also want to make three comments on the book. Uh, first of all, it uh, was also very important for me, I, I told you before, that after I got into crypto anarchy on a you know technical level, the book really really showed the vision, you know, in a visual way. And uh, the second part was um, when I met Pavel actually in in London for the first time. At the end of his presentation, he had the recommended reading list, and he said the Lodging of Wayfaring Man is a must read. And I knew immediately, you know, we have we have some common common themes there and this third part uh, just basically confirming what Smaller said that I think it's very important to have um, people in the in the movement who are not just tech guys but like uh, writers, filmmakers, people who are, can transport the, the uh, vision to people um, in addition to white papers. Okay, thank you. Another question we don't know but we can guess how the government will cope with the existence of such system? Or do you think that the government stop, uh, uh, will, will stop this system in the near future? Or if not, what are your predictions about, about this? Um. I have like I have like two hearts in my chest here. On one hand, I'm I'm very positive and optimistic, like Paul is, um, that we're going to use crypto technology to build this peaceful, um, loving, anarchist utopia society. Um, on the other hand, uh, and and that's the negative and 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 uh, yeah pessimist side in me. Um, the power that governments have uh, due to the surveillance state that we have rolled out is much, much bigger than any of us thinks. It's much deeper than any Snowden or whoever has revealed. And the power that flows from that surveillance state um, is, is pretty overwhelming. Uh, just imagine and here I'm not even a guy technical enough, but I do know, and or assume at least, um, we have the government on the level of our hardware chips by now. Um, <clears throat> and governments do not straight away reveal what power they have there. They wouldn't reverse a Bitcoin transaction or hack some, or break some cryptocurrency or anything like that, because that's that that would show their actual power and it would allow us to work around that um, yeah this is just these two these two heart these two hearts beating in, in in my chest and I don't know where it's where it's going to take us uh, I believe for a number of years that dark markets 
while a great thing need to be protected by something better than ordinary encryption. We have in the past examples of Silk Road, Silk Road 2, and more recently Alpha Bay. These centralized dark markets seem to eventually fail. Why do they fail? Because all they have is a defense. They don't have an offense. If... <laughs> anybody have an idea what I'm going to say next? <laughs> okay, you're, you're an educated audience. Imagine a Silk Road 3 or whatever the next one is going to be, or Alpha Bay 2. If they have a billion dollars worth of business a year, if 1% of that gross value, or $10 million, is paid into a fund to dissuade, discourage, and terrify anybody who would bring a criminal case against anybody who participated in or organized the next dark market, I predict that the next dark market would last for a long time. Without this, have you ever heard the saying, the best defense is a good offense? Well, there is definitely a room for not just the defense with the cryptography, but offense. In a 1964 movie called Dr. Strangelove, does anybody know that movie? Woo! The title character, Dr. Strangelove, toward the end of the movie, said uh, that deterrence or is, is the art of inducing fear into the enemy to attack. The fear to attack. We must make the enemy, that is the government or governments, fear to attack the next dark market. Um, I'm a little bit on, on the other side here. Um, I think we often fall into the trap of underestimating our enemies and simply have a totally naive view on how politics and state systems work. We don't understand too often that it's not single people that work with the same values that we have, but it's networks of people in institutions that have, that are already in a certain pressure situation very often. People that work for um, intelligence agencies, for example, if you're in the field in, in intelligence, you are living with the risk of being killed or being taken hostage or whatever. Um, and the same is true for a shitload of jobs in government. And it, the government actually attracts people that like war. You know, you, you can like war not just from the, from the perspective of being aggressive, but also from the perspective of liking to be in risk. And that is very true for, for a lot of, of government. Plus, governments have had a few thousand years of evolving in a competitive market with other governments of becoming the best wielders of violence. So I actually have this two-sided thing in my heart as well, you know. I would love to say that the future will be rosy and flowers and everything will be fine. But I also think that we have to be prepared for a long, long struggle. Something where we will have setbacks, where we will fail and where we will learn out of our failure, hopefully. The, the question is, will we be willing to learn from our failures and adapt? And in any realistic system, in my opinion, is a system that continues to evolve and to adapt to whatever comes. And we must be prepared that those around us that don't like our vision are able to adapt as well. Um, let me, I, I just told Jim, I said, I'm going to disagree with you, but I will be polite. Um, <laughs> which is the way we have to do things. And I do disagree with Jim. Um, but he, let me tell you why. It's because I see things a little bit differently. When I look at the people in this room, the, the crypto community in general, I see people who are evolving. 
people who are becoming better. Now, it never feels like that to some of us because we're just trying to do a little better today than yesterday. Uh, but if you take a longer, you know, long, longer view at it, I see people who are becoming better and who are learning how to be better and who are here to, so they have it, be around other people who are improving, who, who see a little further than the average person is allowed to see, to see further than the program we would get on television and in government schools and so on. And I think that at all costs, this human evolution, this improvement of the health of human souls, to, to use a, uh, the only word I can think of, human psyches maybe, this is paramount. This is important, and I don't want us to turn into enforcers and uh, to, to use, to be offensive. I want to get away from the state. One of the great quotations uh, that really resonated with me was from Buckminster Fuller. He says, if you want to change things, don't fight what exists. Build a new model and make the existing obsolete. And this is what I want to do, and I don't want anybody in our community to have to be involved with things like killing. It's just not good for us. It's not good for anyone. So, so anyhow, that's my, that's my objection to the uh, Paul, I especially appreciate your humanistic approach and in, in parliament policy we decided to follow this approach we decided not to change the, the current political system in Czech Republic but we just started parliament policy to to show that there there should be something in parallel with the current system uh, so we are just trying to make the parallel system and make promotion to the system <clears throat> okay I have another question a few years ago, a smuggler wrote a document, the second reel, predicting the need of crypto tribalism. So, do you think the crypto anarchy becomes the mainstream in the future, or it will remain a parallel underground movement along the current political system? Because when I see these people, this conference, sometimes I, I think that we are just switching to mainstream, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what is your opinion? I'll, I'll go for it. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to develop a little more slowly than all of us will like. Uh, the great example I like to use of little tiny groups with better ideas uh, growing and growing and growing and eventually affecting at least uh, the majority culture in strong ways are the early Christians. And I don't mean this in any sort of religious way. I'm just looking at it as an analyst. And we have these small group of people who are very determined for their cause and their very, very strong moral opinions. Of what, whatever we think of them, uh, they have very, very strong moral opinions. And these little group, they're multiplied from city to city, they're persecuted everywhere they go. Not that many actually died, but you know, 10, 20,000 people were, you know, were killed. That, that's, that's still a lot to me. To me. Um, but they persisted. And there were plenty of problems with them. They fought amongst themselves. There were all sorts of problems, but they persisted in their core ideals. And eventually Rome had to stop persecuting them because too many of the other Romans were saying, hey, I know this guy. He's my neighbor. He's not a bad guy. You shouldn't be throwing him in jail or whatever, whatever the, the punishments were. They, they weren't always feeding them to the lions. Um, and they eventually had to stop their persecutions. And of course, they bastardized Christianity by trying to merge it into the empire. There were all sorts of problems. But you need to remember that these people persisted and endured. And when Rome fell, they became or affected the majority culture, and I want to give them their due. Uh, I don't like, um, well, I want to give them their due, put it this way. 
the early Christians, and I'm talking 200, 300, now 400 and 500, and the imperial power goes away, and the persecuting, the persecuting wing of the church loses its power because they lost the imperial sword. And we have all these little people in these little towns that have a few scriptures and a few things, but they're really trying to be good. These people destroyed slavery in Europe. It didn't happen in a day. It happened in a few centuries, but... Rome was built upon slavery. These people, for moral reasons, because of their new and better morality, destroyed slavery, and slavery never has returned to Europe. So these type of things, we can win. We can bring our new ideas and make a better culture, a better world. We're not going to be perfect. There are going to be errors along the way. There's going to be problems along the way. It's going to take longer maybe than we want. But it can be done, and we know this because it has been done. Uh, I don't think we, we are going to be mainstream. Um, like we had in another talk, um, it might be related to personality types. Um, however, I think we, we can make uh, progress towards more freedom. And I regard uh, Second Realm as a, an important contribution towards that. Because although I believe in the division of crypto anarchy, I think crypto anarchy as a concept, which is purely virtual, is not big enough. You know, we, we are physical beings and we are social beings. And the concept of a TAZ, a temporary autonomous zone, and something like that's how I view parallel polis as well, is very important because we are physical beings, we, we inhabit physical space. And also uh, the concept of tribes or files or however you want to call it. You know, people who are close to you and they have primary loyalty to, it's also very important. I think that's often a problem, again, maybe related to personality type in, in libertarians that we view ourselves as these individuals. And so uh, I think if we, if we take crypto anarchy and we add these other things, which, you know, comprises us as humans, we, we can really. Um, create a freer world, for, a freer world at least for us and our friends and maybe inspire others to, to go there as well. We might not change the whole world, but if, if we can make it better for us and our you know, important ones and our children, that's, that's already a huge step, I think. Thank you. Smuggler. I don't want to be mainstream. <laughs> you're, you're not. <laughs> you got what you want. <laughs> because I think that mainstream has the issue of becoming boring. <laughs> and my personal hope is that we might, someone in the future, be able to have crypto anarchistic systems living in peace in parallel with other systems and that might include something that looks a lot like today's state but is voluntary because you can run away so my my real hope is actually that we learn how to how to have many competing systems in the same space so that we can challenge each other to actually continue to to learn how to deal with the future and I think one of the worst things that can happen to us is if we ever became mainstream, we would die of our own inability to find challenges. Thank you a lot. Um, um, uh, I want to second that, smuggler. Um, whereas I have a... Why do you agree so much with me today? I don't know. <laughs> um, you're so good looking today. <laughs> Thank you. Let's meet um, afterwards. No, no, no. But, so I don't want to be mainstream either. I don't, I, uh, or at, at least not as long as I live. Um, for one, for one single reason, and I was talking about it, or was trying to talk about it in my talk that I held before um, today, and that is. If we, if we, if the crypto anarchist, crypto economist movement goes mainstream, um, then governments have all motivation and all the means to fight against it, and they they will take it away from me. As of now, the, as big as we are now, um, things like Bitcoin 
are my personal exit strategy. And I think exit is the term here. I think you, you meant something similar. Um, or you did so when you, when you quoted um, Fuller. Um, <clears throat> and exit can, can be individual and it can go to different, uh, let me say it, islands of, of freedom. Um, that are not big enough to be the ultimate threat to the government, but are big enough to uh, develop their network effects and so on and uh, create the possibility to have yeah, exit communities. Yeah. Thank you. Now it's time for the most controversial question. Everybody is waiting for it. <laughs> How are the burgers at Room 77? Okay. So more than 20 Very years ago, Jim Bell wrote the essay Assassination Politics, described the concept of, of assassination markets as a, as a potential of, offense he, he mentioned. It doesn't matter what we think about this idea or not, this concept is already invented. And the functional implementation will be will probably exist in the future, implemented by Jim or someone else. So, despite all of, of all of all of all of this, what do you think about this concept? And please be sincere. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be sincere. <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't think much about the the whole uh, concept for for several quite obvious reasons. Um, if you build assassination markets to target politicians, presidents, ministers, or maybe the level below them, um, you always target the wrong ones anyway. Those guys are not the people running the show. Um, those guys are puppets. On one hand, and on the other hand, they're power-hungry people who want to put their face in front of TV cameras and be uh, mentioned in history books or something like that. And how many of them, however many of them, <laughs> you kill, um, you will always have a new one. You and you will always have crazy, power-hungry people who risk their life for their 15 minutes of fame or their three months of reigning. Um, for example, the, the Roman Empire is a great example. You had a few, you had a, you had a long period in the, in the Roman Empire where basically the military took out the emperor and sold the emperor's throne to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder must have known that he's going to live not longer than another three months before, because then the whole game starts again. Just research it. It just went over one, two hundred years. And they always find some rich idiot who wanted to be an emperor <laughs> for three months, so his face is being casted on a coin. You know, so you're not going to get rid of the people uh, with an assassination market because you cannot target the people behind the people who actually run the show. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, I asked a question tonight before, what do you guys think? How much money are the fans of Manchester United going to put up to get the goalkeeper of FC Barcelona killed the night before the World Championship final? People... <laughs> People who spend a thousand or two thousand euros on a ticket to watch that game, how much money are they going to throw into the pot to see their their team winning? Um, I, I don't think. Uh, now the point is, um, what, however much I like it or dislike it or you like it or dislike it. Um, uh, it's going to happen. We're going to see things like that and uh, don't think that you can uh, have assassination as uh, markets on a centralized, on a centrally controlled platform that makes sure that only evil politicians get killed and not evil goalkeepers. <laughs> not gonna happen. <laughs> I've already had my say on this subject, so I'll defer. Um, is this on camera? Yeah, well, it's it's a very difficult question. Um, first of all, I, I think, like from a, from a moral perspective, it's it's kind of like a, a spectrum of. Um, 
as Jim was saying, I think there's a big difference between just going and killing random people, like random politicians, or in you know more offensive self-defense. Let's say you, your ma market gets taken down or your door gets kicked in and you defend against that. I think that these are a bit uh, different things. And, uh, and my goal would be more moderate to be like in a position where I can be left alone. I don't want to you know, kill random people or um, you know, let them have their government. I just don't want to have them govern me. And that's a, that's a more moderate goal. And the other, the other point I want to comment on is that um, as we also like we heard today, personality types, you know, autistic spectrum and I think for most people, however how, how logical this might sound, and for me it sounds pretty logical, I have to admit it, you know, it, it sounds pretty logical, um, but no matter how logical it sounds, you're not going to sell it to a lot of people, just because for most humans, once you talk about killing people, they're not going to go there. and. Um, and it goes to this, you know, fundamental differences between people. And um, sure, politicians usually they don't have a problem with at least sending other people into war because they are this personality type. But most uh, people in the population they're not going to go with that idea. So I think, um, although a very logical uh, proposal, I think it's morally questionable, and uh, there might actually be better uh, ways to do it. And focusing on more the defense, but increasing the cost of oppressors instead of killing them before they do anything. I kind of feel like I should praise it because everybody else isn't. But from a technical standpoint, I think that implementing something like assassination markets is trivial. and. I think that, to a certain degree, they might actually work like advertised. The problem is this. I don't really know how we would differ from our enemies if we use them. In every struggle, there is this risk to become the monster that you fight. and. I know the attraction of saying let's let's solve problems with violence, but that is exactly the concept of a state. And I don't think that a state run on cryptography is a better state than one run without cryptography. And for me, assassination markets is nothing else like a democratized cryptographic state of violence. So I'm not for it. However, however, no, stop. <laughs> <clears throat> All you know me know that I have these complex things where I cannot really agree what to answer, you know, with myself. So um, yesterday, Jim, um, I think you you invited people on your team to verify the product, to to get into the thing, do a tough analysis of it, and I think I would like to apply for that project. <laughs> And I think I would like to to work with you on on checking if this project is actually philosophically good under one condition, and that is, can you define what what constitutes a defeating argument for your system? Can you define what makes your system fail philosophically? so that I can see if I can come up with an argument that will um, satisfy you. Okay, I'd like to address a previous comment that was made before we address you. Uh, to those who would say that the wrong people would be targeted, my assassination politics idea is not directed by the people who run the organization. The people who direct it are those who effectively make the donations. If you think that the it's ineffective to name the topmost people, the answer is that the public will be the ones who will decide who the proper targets are. But that's the problem. 
The public is stupid. The public believes it's the president running the show. If you take the initial position that the public is stupid, you've just about given up right then and there. That, well, the argument that says the public is stupid is sort of the same argument that said we have to be le led by intelligent and benevolent people. And no, they will, the argument is they to remove power. Us. Hmm? The argument is to remove power so you don't need that leadership anymore. That's right. You, you prevent, prevent people from controlling others. It's essential to do that. Look at all the kinds of totalitarian governments that have existed in the last hundred years. They were all directed ostensibly by the best, brightest, benevolent people. Or at least they would have called themselves that. And they would have said to themselves, the people are stupid. You know, they, won't, they, can't, they can't be trusted to make the right decisions. Well, I think the people can be trusted to make the right decisions. As for the people who say, well, assassination politics won't be used by more than a tiny fraction of the people. Ordinary pol politics is based on the principle that we let 51% of the population decide who will be in office. All right? Even if only 1% of the population use my AP system, donate to it, it will work as advertised. It will not be necessary for 99% of the people to be involved at all. Uh, so it's not going to be one of those things that everybody's going to have to buy in. It, as I said 22 years ago, it's inevitable even if you don't like it. And I realize that may not be particularly comforting to those of you who haven't thought about it as long as I did. Before I even wrote word one of my essay, I decided that ultimately it'll end up in a very boring society. It will be without threats, because why? Anybody who threatens will not stick around to threaten much longer. It's uncomfortable to think about death, but the answer is ultimately the goal is to deter people from doing things to other people, and if it takes ultimately the threat of death to do it, or to, to cause them to not, that is ultimately what happens. I mean, in admittedly in Europe, they don't have the death penalty. You guys consider yourself superior to, for example, America. but. A lot of people consider in America that there are bad people that have to be deterred. Uh, death is not the automatic punishment for every crime. In fact, the vast majority are not. But if we're trying to protect ourselves from very bad people, I think we must. There must be a deterrent effect available. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to add my, my personal note, if I can. Uh, yesterday, we had a discussion with my friend, and we invented or described the pacifistic version of assassination market. <laughs> I would like to describe this pacifistic version. So there is a security problem with this assassination market. Uh, the problem is that uh, if you're a politician, Theoretically, you can fake your own death. So you can you can just make a bet, like a prediction bet, to your uh, to to the date of your own death, and in a completely anonymous way, just to uh, fake your own death and take the money. Uh, the thing, okay, so this is just the beginning. The thing is, is that how the assassination market can cope with this uh, security vulnerability. So. Oh, it's quite easy how to cope with that. Uh, so you just not give the murderer money immediately, but you just make an agreement. You will receive this reward, this bounty, in the period of five years. For example, one fifth in, during the first year, another fifth, second year, third year, and so on. So it basically means that, uh, and the condition is that the, the victim 
the victim, the murdered victim, cannot appear, cannot appear in the future, you know. So what I want to tell you is that the pacifistic version of this assassination market can be that if some politician is really afraid about his own life, he just make the bet, he fake his own death, and he will disappear. He just disappear, he just disappear, and the people are fine. <laughs> you know, the people are fine for another, for, because, you know, the most, like, most people who do not wish, no, no, uh, do not wish that some pol politicians should exist, I think it's are completely fine with the situation when the given politician will stop exist for five or ten years, you know. <laughs> they are completely fine with that. So what I want to tell you is that that assassination market in this situation can work not as a killing portal, but just a like we mentioned before, like deterring portal, just to, just to afraid to to to, to, to you know. So 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 finally, uh, finally it can work in this pessimistic version, I think. Can I make a comment on that about that? Uh, in about two thousand two, two business partners. One was named Robert Vroman, that's spelled V-R-O-M-A-N, and uh, Bob Murphy, I don't know what they do as business partners. They actually did a point-counterpoint critique of my AP essay. They, along with R. Sukumaran, are the only people who have really done an analysis of the idea. Now, Robert Vroman was in, f in favor of the AP system. And he addressed in much better detail than I would be able to in a, a, sh a, f a few short minutes, the very issue about a politician faking his death and going away. Or somehow, well, basically that's, that's what the, the concept was. And he decided that that would be ineffective or would not be effective at making the system ineffective. Why? Because this, from the standpoint of everybody else in the world, as far as they're all aware, that guy is dead. So in terms of all the reactions to that, they will think that the AP system worked. The guy disappeared, he's dead. And if, if he, everybody knows he isn't dead, like, yeah, he's not really dead. <laughs> and that, if, if, it's, if it's so such a well-known secret that it's, he's, not, he's not dead, then it won't change anything. People will just know that a person can, can sneak away and avoid getting killed. Well, that's fine. I mean, I, if they want to sneak away and disappear forever, and the next guy in the chain of command in government has to sneak away, pretty soon you have all these people sneaking away. Well, fine, let them sneak away. We would love that. If, they, if everybody currently in government snuck away tomorrow, we'd be a lot better off than we are today. Um, okay. <laughs> smuggler. Okay, smuggler first. I, I, I really like that idea because from game theory perspective, I am now considering becoming the worst politician of all times. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> and you, and you, because people you will step on my death and I will have the golden parachute. So, um, yeah, that I think that is actually a great method if you want to find out how many idiots you can have in office in the shortest amount of time. <laughs> Please, sir. I, I was about to uh, kind of make the same point. I mean, basically, you, you incentivize people to go into politics and be the biggest asshole around ever, <laughs> um, because then more people will bet on your on your assassination, and you are the guy who takes all the money away when you disappear. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just turn the system around completely. Uh, it is. Yeah, and there is there is, is another. It is clearly not not a solution if uh, being Stalin is a career option again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is definitely a good point, and there is another point that if you dis disappear, you can still control the new politician. You know, your 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 follower. That's that's because if you are not that. You can still have power, and you can still have some influence over the new politicians. So this, this so this is another second vulnerability, and we need to find a way how to fix it. Okay, <laughs> next to another question. 
So, Jörg, uh, you became one of the first Bitcoiners in Germany with your famous restaurant room 77 in Berlin. And this question is related to truly anonymous cryptocurrency currencies like Monero or Zcash. I know that the situation regarding cryptocurrency is pretty bad in Germany. I mean, like Bitcoin ATM machines are almost prohibited. It's not possible to use local Bitcoins. Uh, so, do you think, and this may be also the, the question to, the, to Smuggler and Frank Brown, is it possible to, at this time to, um, and legal to accept truly anonymous cryptocurrencies in Germany now? Yes, it is. So it is possible to do that, okay. And do you think truly anonymous cryptocurrencies will be prohibited soon by the German or European government? Because personally, I think there, like, we, there was a big conference of Europol and Interpol and, and this organization, they really tried to persuade the government to make uh, the ban of Bitcoin mixers as well as truly anonymous cryptocurrencies. So, what is your opinion about this? Um, <clears throat> the point is that you do not have certain cryptocurrencies that are totally anonymous and others that are less anonymous. Of, of course, you have them at a, at, a, at a certain moment, like right now. Mm -hmm. Monero is, uh, definitely offers much more privacy than mm -hmm. Bitcoin does, but, everything, but, but uh, Bitcoin is catching up in these regards. All the stuff that's coming up, coin join, coin join, uh, mimble wimble, tumble bit, I don't know. So, uh, go governments will not start picking. Oh, this is a cryptocurrency that uh, should be prohibited, and okay, this one we can let go. They either prohibit the whole thing, or or not at all. And at least at the moment, uh, the strategy of governments and central banks is not to prohibit the stuff because they still have a hope that they can just co-opt it. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I also meant earlier today in my talk. Uh, oh no, this is also what, I, what, what we were talking about. Um, the more mainstream we get, if, on first glance it looks like then, that the more dangerous we get. Because it's more and more people. Uh, but the other problem is, and I'm sorry that I said the, 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 the public is stupid or the people are stupid. Uh, I should have thought about that and, and, and phrased it a bit more careful. But the point is, the more people go into the crypto economy, the easier it is um, to influence uh, the majority of the people. Like in the last couple of years, uh, who was in Bitcoin, who was in cryptocurrencies, it was all freedom-loving people who wanted to change the system and who understood the technology how to change the system. Now, if you look at the people who are coming into, into cryptocurrencies right now, it's mostly people who want to make a quick buck um, or think it's, a, it's, a, it's something cool, like Apple was cool 25 years ago or something like that. And these are exactly the people <laughs> that can... What's funny about that? <laughs> And these are these are the people who can easily be influenced um, by propaganda, by public relations, and um, uh, that's also what I meant when I said uh, the people are stupid. So to come back to to your topic, I I would like people to stop electing a leader for that rules me. I want them to stop for vote to vote for something, and I especially don't want them to start to vote on who is supposed to get killed. It's just, let's let's stop the voting bullshit and not add another layer on top of it that, you know. But to, to come back to your question, I think the, the strategy would be to co-opt um, mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies like the internet was co-opted. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when the internet started, I remember that I was around, um, we had all these visions of, wow, uh, this is going to free mankind and we have uh, uncensored information and, and anonymous communication and all that. And what do we have now? Google and Facebook. Um, <laughs> It's true, and I know personally from from individual talks to to Bitcoin developers, to people who are coding on the very basis of this of this whole new economy, that they totally understand that we made huge mistakes when we rolled out the internet. 
Um, and uh, with, with cryptocurrency and crypto technology right now, we can actually try to fix some of these mistakes we made in the early, in the early days. I could go into detail there, but I don't know if we have enough time. Um, so yeah, the people who are developing crypto currency at the core, not meaning Bitcoin core, I mean at the core, um, <laughs> this is also Monero and this is also Zcash or whatever, are very well aware of the mistakes that were made when the internet was built and rolled out and rolled out and that we really, really need to be careful now rolling out this crypto economic layer on top of it not to make the same mistakes again. Thank you. So, me personally, I still see the difference uh, between pseudo anonymous cryptocurrencies, uh, bitcoins, uh, and not only me, but also the, from the government perspective. Because the problem is that in these days, we have multiple, I think, at least five different uh, companies doing digital forensic analysis of Bitcoin blockchain for the governments, for the tax offices, for Interpol, Europol and all these uh, all organization. And they, they, they do that for Bitcoin blockchain, not for Monero blockchain, which what is not technically feasible. So that's uh, why I personally am, am afraid of that Bitcoin in the future can be or will be accepted as a as a standard, because there are a lot of a lot of ways how to de-anonymize the the Bitcoin transaction from the blockchain. Even now, we have a, like uh, such companies, and I think that because of technical impossibility in case of truly anonymous uh, cryptocurrencies, I personally think that the government will ban truly anonymous cryptocurrency. So I think that there is. There will be you a think difference. they're going to pick some and say there's a bad cryptocurrency? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, I think they, can, they can just say, okay, any cryptocurrencies with a fungibility property will be prohibited. Thanks. Bye. I think, I think the, the more realistic thing is somewhere in between. And that is, it, I, th I agree with Jörg that it's kind of really hard to say, okay, we're going to ban this, bit, uh, this blockchain-based currency and we allow this one. That is almost too many complex decisions for a government to make. Um, mm -hmm. But we should never forget that the cryptocurrencies usually don't stand alone. They're within a web of merchants, users, exchangers and banks. And what I see rather is that exchangers will be regulated towards the point where for them, it becomes illegal to exchange um, untraceable um, <laughs> cryptocurrencies. So I, I don't see that the cryptocurrency itself is going to be banned. Um, I see that the exchangers will be unable to comply with anti-money laundering rules and so on and so on if they want to work with untraceable cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Thank you a lot for your opinion. Okay, let's move to another question. In 2013, we, in Progress Bar, we organized unsystem, unsystem crypto meetup. You know this, you, you were there. <laughs> and Frank Brown had a presentation there. And for me, uh, still resonates one, one sentence he, he mentioned in my mind. I remember this sentence. Technology leads, politician just follow. So, how do you perceive the new technologies, especially like anonymous insurance companies or anonymous prediction markets, which allow the perfect corruption of the existing politician and of course allow disruption of the existing political system? How do you perceive it? Do you think that these technologies will be used or, yeah? Yeah, um, I think I became a bit more pessimistic since then, or maybe just old, like I, like I said in my presentation. Um, I, I think um, we, I think you already talked about this, that uh, this concept of the free market, that it doesn't exist, and that it's people actually doing things, and the effect is the free market. And I think a bit in technology, it's the same. Um, although I was talking about that technology drives everything, it's ultimately people 
building technology and they can build totalitarian technology, they can build the fully traceable cryptocurrencies or they can build anonymous currencies. And in the same, it's, similarly, it's the users also deciding what, what they're using. So uh, I, I do believe these solutions you, you mentioned, they are, they're feasible, but uh, it's still, they still need to be built and they still need to be used. And we can also all, you know, use uh, Facebook and Apple Pay and, and live in this, you know, uh, smiling um, utopia, <laughs> which will be uh, totally controlled. Or we can sometimes, you know, do a bit more um, inconvenient use more inconvenient technologies which are but make us freer so it's it's uh, although from the outside it looks like technology is driving ultimately uh, it's people who build technology and and, and use it so right. I'm gonna be the optimist again um, <clears throat> well, there are a couple different advantages uh, that technology gives us the first one is is that we are so much faster than the legislative process we can adapt uh, any, who knows, anybody in this room or any of thousands of others can come up with a new adaptation, get it, build it, put it out, and people are using it within a number of whatever, months, whatever it may be. It will take five years for that to be outlawed. First of all, the political system won't know about it very quickly. They see big things, they don't see small things, and all of our things pretty much start small. Uh, and it takes a long time to get laws passed. Um, they have to deal with the donors who are buying laws and are, don't, who are trying to keep laws from being engaged. You have the politicians, you have the committees, you have the, you know, all of the hearings and everything else. It takes time. That means that we have to not just adapt once, but we must continue to adapt. Because our opponents really are powerful. They have a lot of armed men that they employ. They have a lot of social inertia. There's, there's millions and millions of people who are basically good people. There's nothing wrong with them. They've just been taught all their lives that the system is necessary. It's what keeps things going. It's what keeps the poor people fed. It's what keeps everything going. And we have to support the system. So all of those people are involved as well. So here's the second point. Technology tends to drag people forward faster than social inertia. If you look at the Industrial Revolution, most of Europe was still had an old world mentality where this is my city, I have my roots here, here's the church, here's all the people I know. And they were, to a very large extent, very comfortable in that setting. There's, there was a lot of beauty to that setting. You knew everybody. Everybody knew you. You had stability. Stability is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you're old. Especially if you're old, you really like stability. Um, but they had a very consistent way of life, and there was some beauty in that. Then comes the Industrial Revolution, and all of a sudden, all of the little boys, young men and women, are moving to the big city to take a job. And they would not have done this had not the steam engine and so on come along to make this a very profitable way of life that they could get better stuff. They could eat better food. They can have better services. They can get ice cream and coffee, which were big things at the time, and read newspapers. And the technology drew them out of the small town into the big city faster than anything else would have. So technology tends to drag people forward into the future, and this is what we're seeing with Bitcoin. How many thousands of people now are using Bitcoin and getting some kind of understanding, a deep understanding, this understanding that comes from doing, not just talking, getting an understanding of what decentralization can be, what it's about, how it works, what it might be. Technology is dragging people forward into that much faster than they would have without it. So I've actually become more optimistic in the last year or two rather than less. Now, all the problems that these gentlemen talk about are real. They're, they're no joke. This is not going to be a walk in the park. There's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. I mean, my God, is Charlie Shrem out of jail now? Good. He's finally out of jail. But Ross Ulbricht is in jail for a good long time. Um, 
And there's others. There's going to be victims along the way. This is not going to be a pretty process. We have real problems. Uh, it's, every day is not going to be roses and light. But I've been more optimistic recently. My God, seeing what I call I'm old enough to save the Bitcoin kids. Sorry if I'm, you know, I'm not trying. I'd say that affectionately. Um, uh, but, but, I like that. Yeah, we'll take it, right? Uh, but, you know, there's so many, and they get it. And are they doing things perfectly? No, of course not. Everyone has to start somewhere, and we all grow and we all learn. But my God, there's tens of thousands of people who are working with decentralized technology on a daily basis. This is a big deal. And this is making me more optimistic. But again, we have to be serious, and there's going to be bad days, and there's going to be times when we're going to have to pay a price. Thank you. I'd like to make a comment about something Pavel pointed out. He referred to corrupt politicians. The, the solution to a corrupt politician is to give him no power at all. A politician accepts a bribe and is offered a bribe because he has power and he can sell that power for a bribe. A politician that has no power at all cannot sell his influence because he has no influence to sell. So if you're trying, if you're worried about corrupt politicians, the easy solution, or at least the simple solution, is to take away the power from the politicians. Thank you. And it was my last question. And before the question from the audience, I would like to ask you, each of you, to tell your personal message, if you have some personal message, to our visitors of Parallel Police Congress. Got no other personal message for you than buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose one of the things that I want to say most is we are better and can be better than we've been given credit for. Uh, we live in a, in a system that requires us to be insecure, that requires us to second-guess ourselves, that requires us to think that people need to be ordered around in order for, for us to survive. Once we break out of that, once lots of people break out of that, our future is magnificent. And we are built for it. We can do this. We just have to break out of a system that n requires us to feel bad about ourselves. And what we're doing here is a big way out. My message is use anonymous cryptocurrencies. Yes, um, my message is that we, the Technology is the most powerful force we have in human history and we can use it for good things and we can use it for bad things. And if we use it for good things, we can make a great, you know, we can build a great future. And if we're not careful, we end up in a really shitty situation. And I hope all together we can build the good stuff and use it. I have no personal message. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's question time. Oh. Yeah. So I guess this question is for you, Jim. So, so the, the idea with assassination market is you pick a date when the guy is supposed to die, right? But wouldn't that just make him beef up on security on that day and it would be like contradicting itself? I don't okay. Um. One essential element of my idea is that the predictions are, that are made are anonymously made, and moreover that they are, well, one term is blinded. If you can imagine the digital equivalent of putting a prediction in an envelope and sealing up the envelope, and then only unsealing it when the instructions come back unseal it. Everybody knows the prediction has been made 
and if it's done in with encrypted version, everybody can see the encrypted version of the prediction, but they don't know what it says. They don't say, it doesn't have the name, it doesn't have the date, or anything like that. So your concern, apparently, is based on the idea that the prediction is public before the event. That That's not going to happen. Let me counterpoint that. A few years ago, back in about 2003, the federal government of the United States independently, sort of, proposed a system called policy analysis markets. It was dubbed uh, terrorism futures by the news media, and the proposal died within one day. Yeah. Policy analysis markets, PAM, and they, the theory behind that is it was like a stock market for terrorist actions. You would put money down on the attack on something at a given future. The theory was that somebody knows something that's going to happen and they may want to make some money for themselves, so they will effectively leak the, f the event ahead of time by, by buying a future. Okay, if everybody knows what a future market uh, is. Well, their, their proposed system assumes that the prediction is open, that the person who's buying this says the date he thinks something will happen, and the theory is that it will be eventually prevented because it doesn't happen. In my AP system proposal, the date, the name and the date will be sealed up digitally posted publicly, but in a version you cannot identify. It'll be ones and zeros, and you don't know what they mean. Only if the event occurs will you eventually be able to verify that the prediction was made correctly. So the, per the target or nobody else would be able to use that information to protect themselves. Um, hi, I have another more like a comment, not a question, also about this assassination markets idea. I'm a little bit surprised that nobody is kind of talking about the elephant in the room when we're talking about electronic contracts that depend on real-world events, be that fluctuation in stock price or assassination of somebody. We have to ask ourselves where does the information come from? Who actually provides the assassination market with the information whether the person died or not? Is it some kind of doctor? The doctor can be bribed, the doctor can be killed. Uh, I think that's the major problem with this idea. I would like to comment. I, w I suggest people follow the Ethereum uh, system. Well, Ethereum, and not the currency Ethereum, but the system of Ethereum. It's a kind of distributed computer system that was started a couple years ago. And also the Augur system, which is a kind of prediction market that works on the Ethereum system. They're solving the problem of how do you input information. They don't want to have to, a problem where they only have one individual putting in the information. Uh, they want to have it distributed among many people for obvious reasons. They don't want corruption to occur. Uh, so if the answer to that is currently being worked on in Augur running on Ethereum, which I think the combination of those two is great. For one thing, Augur could be used for lots of ordinary insurance purposes, life insurance, crop insurance, property insurance, but it has some definitely some more interesting uses other than that. Uh, this is an open question for the whole panel uh, that agrees with uh, the proposition that there's no virtue in being harmless. Um, is there any like historical um, data that we can strip mine for information? Because it, it's kind of tough because we don't really want to build on other states. And um, it's kind of hard to figure out the logic of violence uh, compared to the logic of mutually beneficial cooperation. Is there any historical matters we can look into? Uh, there have been a number of peaceful cultures that have existed for long periods of time. Uh, was that the type of thing you're interested in? Am I understanding you correctly? Well, 
it's a very difficult problem. If if we become if we become violent, where do we stop the violence? Uh, it's a that's a very difficult problem. Um, I, I, I don't know how that's done. I can't think of anybody that became violent and, and restrained it over time. Rome and Greece began that way. Uh, they tried to do this, but it's too complicated to go into the details. Uh, but they made it a hard rule that there could be no king. Um, and that the individual citizens were the ones responsible and you had to convince them to march off to war rather than order them to march off with war. But once you do that, once you have these type of systems, eventually Rome, the Republic, which had some virtue in it, uh, became the Roman Empire and became a dominator. And I don't see how once you, um, once you make violence a virtuous tool, where does it stop? I don't, I'm not thinking right off of anybody who has done that effectively over a long period of time. Uh, I just don't know of any. Um, I think there's a difference between um, being harmless and doing harm. Um, well, I, I don't believe in deterrence, but the reason is that I think that we're talking about false analogies here. You know, it's like uh, lions and sheep and whatever, you know? but we're using crypto. And I think the better model to think about that is to think about ourselves as bacteria. You know, lions can't fight bacteria, but bacteria eat lion. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> this next question is, uh, is for any of you. Um, thanks to uh, the rise of Bitcoin price and cryptocurrencies in general, uh, there are now thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people around the world who share this sort of this sort of ideology and also have significant wealth. And hopefully looking forward, say, five, ten years in the future, you know, that number will grow one, two orders of magnitude in size, we don't know. Um, what is it you recommend that people who share this ideology can do with those resources to most effectively bring about change? Maybe send me a Bitcoin or two. <laughs> Please. What I think is important is that people build. Don't, don't spend too much time talking and planning this, but actually build new things. Bitcoin is a very nice tool. Bitcoin can't do everything. Uh, you are not going to replace credit cards with Bitcoin. Uh, because the Visa system handles, I don't know, 50, 60,000 transactions per minute. Bitcoin can't do that. It won't do that. So we want to build. We have a core, and again, the people matter even more than the technology, but we have a really good core now. It's, it's wonderful. And we want to build things around it. We want to build tools. We want to build this tool. If, if you've got some some Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, and, and you've already you know bought your house and you have extra money, Build something that matters. Put your heart and soul into something that you think will build the crypto economy. Turn it into a real world system. Build whatever pieces you think are the most important and build them. Some of them won't work. Okay, bad luck, sorry, that's life. But if we keep building, we learn from the mistakes. Some of them will work. Some of them will work pretty well. And then some other guy will have an adaptation that will be even better. We need to just do all these things. We need to build, experiment, learn, adapt. And my god, we have some capital to do it with nowadays. Wow. I would like to add, if, if you're not a builder and if you, you know, acquired some wealth through, to, uh, through cryptocurrencies, um, invest them in the cryptocurrency space, you know, spend them in the cryptocurrency space and, you know, let the money flow in the system, you know, don't put it out and put it again into the state system, try to build a new system. I think there's a huge opportunity we have there, you know, and we can already see it, crowdfunding, some good ICOs, a lot of shitty ICOs, and that's normal, you know, some of the money will be wasted. But really, you know, support the people who build great products with your cryptocurrencies by buying from them with cryptocurrencies, and that will, you know, really improve the, the system.
So what I'm hearing is uh, the assassination market concept has been around for two decades. And the second thing I'm hearing is it's a trivial thing to implement, which I one thing is a truth statement. The second, I'm pretty sure, is a truth statement. So what does that say about the actual plausibility of the realization of this idea? Uh, do you think it'll just always be kind of like a hypothetical, psychological possible attack, just like to nerve, to, to nerve the people up, uh, up top or the general public? And then I also want to ask, ask like a really dumb binary question. Do you think this is because people are generally good or generally scared? Like why haven't people, why hasn't someone built this and why aren't people using it? Are people good or are they scared? I, uh revealed the idea in approximately April of 1995 and it was transferred to the cypherpunks list very shortly and thence I began inhabiting the cypherpunks list. One of the very early criticisms which was perfectly understandable remember in 1995 uh, Bitcoin didn't exist. Tor didn't exist. Good encryption, well, it existed in the form of PGP. Uh, basically, people found it very hard to imagine that a big, complicated piece of software could be written to do all these things. Uh, I'm, my understanding is, is Bitcoin was a marvel of construction. You. 23 years ago, 22 years ago, the idea that something like that could exist was hard to imagine. Uh, in order for an assassination market to be put together, you had to put a number of tools together. We don't really have those tools quite yet. Bitcoin is not quite anonymous. Tor is controlled, well, has been limited in effectiveness to have like a, a, a three hop system input node, transfer node, output node. These, these tools are all, they're good if I'm trying to keep any one of you from knowing where I'm calling from or what I'm saying, but they're not particularly good when you're talking about the NSA or the G, Britain's GCHQ. I think it's now, uh, would be considered fairly straightforward if these tools were modified to be more secure and more appropriate. Uh, it would be, I think, a task no more complex than Bitcoin was, and in fact, probably substantially less. So there's good reasons why people doubted it 22 years ago, but we've seen enough development in software to realize that people could actually implement it fairly straightforwardly. I would like to add to the answer. Mm -hmm. um, I actually read the paper when it came out. So I was on Cypherpunks and I was thinking about it and then I put it away and then since then every few months somebody comes around and says, hey, did you hear about assassination markets? So. In a way, uh, everybody is challenging you, challenging you all the time if something like that can be built and so on. And when I said that something like that can be built, I, I actually mean it. I, I think it's not that hard actually to, to implement. But maybe it's, at least for me, I hope that the answer why it's not there is that people that are able to build it don't want to have the responsibility for blood on their hands, on the one hand. or they're just by now bored with the idea. Just very briefly, uh, the economic perspective, I think the um, de demand is not as high as for darknet uh, markets for drugs. Mm -hmm. And the risk profile is much higher, so that's why, you know, there is no supply. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would ask from the from the gender distribution of the panel and also of the in general of the or my experience of the crypto anarchist community. I I, 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 I feel like there is we are not uh, emily distributed across gender identity and would like to know what what, what the people in the panel thinks about this. What assumption do you make about my gender? <laughs>
Okay, so the question was about uh, gender distribution of panelists. Like, like probably that, if, if I understood it correctly, that the problem is that there are all males here, or? No, it's, I'm not saying it is. Okay, okay, so, so the question is why you are just men here, not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let me, let me quickly add something. Uh, yeah, the, currently there are just men here, but there are a lot of women in the audience. Um, and there's, we've had a number of women speakers. One of the interesting things is there are more women involved with cryptocurrencies than there ever were in the general libertarian groups. And the hacking groups. Yeah, and the hacking groups. So the number of women that are involved in these things has really gone up in recent years. Uh, it's still majority male, but there's no reason it should be. Let me just say that uh, I, I think we shouldn't drag identity politics into that. If we really want to be you know, diverse, we should try to make everything 50-50. We can, we can just you know, let it play out as it plays out. And <laughs> it seems to play out really well right now. And um, I would really suggest to direct that question to women. Uh, obviously, you have you have a couple of men here uh, who would not at all mind uh, if if the the panel was was fifty fifty male female. So yeah, I would redirect that question to women. And on the internet, nobody knows if you're a dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, here is another question, uh, Jimbel. I really admire your idea in the way that how it the hex the system. Uh, but uh, what's uh, uh, if you, if you know Lucius Cornelius Sulla from Rome, he he made the proscriptions. Yeah. Okay. Again. So, uh, it, do you know Lucius Cornelius Sulla from Rome? It, it, it was a dictator who created the proscriptions. Uh, sh should I speak louder? Yeah, okay. okay. It's hard to yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, if you know Lucius Cornelius Sulla, he he was a dictator in Rome, and he made the proscriptions. And how it's different? What? Okay. 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 Uh. Now you hear me. Okay. Okay. So, if you know Lucius Cornelius Sulla, he created the proscriptions. And what's the difference between proscriptions and your assassination market? Basically, even libertarians can be a target, and everybody can implement the, uh, the that assassination market uh, in another, in another, on another group. So, uh, is do you see some there virtue, and what's the difference between pro proscriptions? As for old Roman emperors, Come on. first off, remember, you're speaking to an American. Americans, <laughs> Americans are famously ignorant of history, including our own. So now, I may be more familiar than most, but I, I can't claim that Roman emperors are a uh, main topic of mine. I, I did watch a series called Rome a few years ago, and it was very interesting and well done, and the, the costumes were great, but uh, what can I say? Um, there's an added effect that you can have when you have an anonymity, okay? We, we sometimes don't see it because we're immersed in it. A fish doesn't know what water is because he's immersed in it all the time. Uh, if people can act and nobody knows who they are, they can do things that they couldn't do if people did know who they are. And if you, can, if you need to defend yourself without making your identity known, you can do that, or you will shortly be able to do that with the internet, good encryption, and and digital cash. Anything you want to do, you can do anonymously, or I, at least that's the theory and we will do it. So there are enormous differences between historical uh, events and what we have today. Uh, it just is, uh, 
an amazing difference. You know, 30 years ago, I couldn't pay you money without physically handing something to you or mailing something to you. With digital cash, which was actually invented concept by a guy named David Chalm back in the 80s, he, he hypothesized a system where people who have never met can exchange value without any physical contact or one person even have, knowing who the other person is. That changes everything. It really does. Thank you. Another uh, question? Yeah, I, I was just wondering, is like this assassination market stuff always come up, like it's very sort of reoccurring topic for like a few years, but I never came across, so the question is, did you ever come across some LARP or like real life action role play that someone actually tried to prototype it? Okay, uh, you're asking, I believe, did anybody ever try to implement it? No, I mean try to implement it in, in, in a prototypey kind of way, right? Let's say we all agree here that we're just going to play this game till the next year and see who's dead by the next of the year. But I mean, not physically dead, but maybe shot with a, what is this, a pain, paintball gun or something like that. Okay, if I, heard, if I understood that correctly, back in, uh, back in November of uh, 2013, a person operating under the name Sanjuro said publicly, well, he, he was unidentifiable, he was anonymized, that he was going to implement the system. Uh, in fact, he contacted me, I didn't, had no idea who he was, but I got an anonymous email, I think it was sent through the Tor network, and he said he was going to implement my system. He was going to call it the assassination market. Well, my response was, first of all, I congratulated him and thanked him, and I suggested he be very careful. Uh, but while I didn't say it right then and there, but I later commented on uh, Cypherpunk's list, the one clear, from my standpoint, flaw in his system, that he had a minimum bid of one uh, Bitcoin, which at the time was around $300 in value. I had anticipated donations of a dollar, 50 cents, you know, 10 cents, very little, that was a flaw, I thought. Whether or not he was actually serious about doing it, we don't know. Uh, I tried to stay away because I didn't want to access his system to learn about it. Why? Because I didn't want possibly the government to think I was actually controlling it. So I figured I'd just wait for a few weeks, listen to the news media reports on it, and maybe they would tell me how this thing is actually implemented. It's, it was like a tool. Well, how do you control the tool? How do you send in the money? How do, you, uh, how do people guarantee that the person who makes the prediction uh, gets the money? All these were unstated, uh, things, and I never got a picture of how credible this guy's claim was. So, uh, as far as I know, it might have been serious, it might not have been serious. Um, to be honest, a proof of concept working implementation of your assassination uh, prediction market was implemented here in Prague on the first Bitcoin conference in 2000, was it 11 or 12? Um, we put Mickey Mouse on there. It, it was fully functional except the Oracle. The Oracle is uh, what some, somebody in the audience asked before, how does the system know that somebody actually died? So, uh, however, assassination prediction market was already fully implemented um, without the Oracle. Um, and all I can say is that the reaction of everybody on that Bitcoin conference, which was probably, you had more radicals percentage-wise on that conference than you have nowadays, uh, the reaction of about everybody was like a total rejection of, uh, go away with that shit here, come on, nobody needs it. It's all I, it's all I can say. But yeah, they have been implemented. This cannot possibly be the only implementation that was ever made. And um, Smuggler is uh, totally right in saying it's, it's quite trivial, actually, to build them, except the Oracle. 
I, I remember that conference and uh, as it usually goes, an overambitious programmer just says, oh, this is very easy, I can do this in an afternoon. And he did it in an afternoon pretty much and then he kind of woke up to the risk realizations and sh quickly shut it down. Did, uh, did Mickey Mouse actually get killed or was this a dry run? <laughs> No, we took, it was taken offline before uh, Mickey Mouse could actually be killed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that reminds me, uh, a few years back, I don't know whether it was 2013 or 12 or something, I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I've never actually played something called Grand Theft Auto, but a few years back I heard that they had added a feature that you could donate money to kill a fellow player or something. Not in reality, of course, I mean in, within the context of the game. Uh, anybody who's ever played video games knows that they can get rather realistic. I can remember 35 or 40 years ago when I was play, playing a game called Colossal Cave Adventure, which all you could do is give little you know left right or west east north controls take lamp drop keys well after playing that for about 12 hours and i left the computer every time i did something i mentally thought to myself open door open refrigerator take food eat you know in other words you get immersed it within the context of the game use the microphone uh jim what's that microphone Okay, so if, if, if this grant, again, I don't know about Grand Theft Auto, but I think we could learn a lot by, put it, by studying the history of that feature, the kill your opponent in the game feature. Uh, it might not be entirely accurate as a model, but it would be uh, interesting to find out how it would work. Uh, there was another game called the Sim City or the Sim, or I don't know what, I, yeah, I missed a lot of that stuff where you could add features like that without actually having the risk of blood being drawn. And you might learn a lot about how people interact under those kinds of systems. Uh, I don't know. Uh, say again, please. <laughs> Pokemon Go might turn into that as soon people uh, don't look left and right while they want to catch this little thing <laughs> on the street. Okay, I didn't get that that, uh, that uh, conversation. Trivial popular culture, totally unimportant. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, anyway, uh, hmm. things can be simulated sometimes, and uh, human interaction is difficult, but even it could be simulated to some degree. Uh, artificial intelligence is a is a, an old field that's always about ten or twenty years into the future. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's, it's an un, unsolved problem right now. Okay. So, uh, smuggler, something to it. Yeah. Okay. Next question. So the the audience will hate me because my question is again about assassination market. But it's not the only controversial thing here. I mean, about other topics, we are, we all agree about everything. So let, let's go on. And for a change, I will not ask uh, Jim about implementation. I'm super skeptical about Oracle problem economics. I'm really super skeptical. But I will ask to the panelists that are actually expressed the uh, moral opposition or skepticism to the idea uh, about uh, these two uh, feedback about these two considerations. First, you are assuming that an assassination market doesn't exist uh, while it, it, it does. Uh, I mean, uh, right now, a, a, a drug cartel can pay money to assassinate somewhere else. So when your objection is uh, it will not work because it will target wrong people or it, in, it will not work because people that will be killed are unimportant and others will take the place, you are, you, are, you are making general objection to the assassination market concept. But I think that the, the, the topic here is actually the extension of an existing assassination market because right now the CEO of Apple can actually pay, to if he wants, to assassinate the CEO of Samsung or, or about soccer players. It can happen. Here the, the topic is the extension to the same power that is actually 
possible into physical hierarchical organization to anonymous uh, internet-based organization. So it's not a thing as about this thing can exist or not, but can it be extended and what are what will be the, the outcomes? And the second part of my question would be uh, actually calling it assassination market actually uh, generates a lot of uh, uh, moral questions because it's like the reaction to any kind of state violence should be murder or, or, or killing. While actually the, the, the natural libertarian, let's say, an anarchic uh, non-aggression principle should also probably include a proportionate, uh, let's say, retaliation principle or reaction principle that could also be positive, like uh, let's bet on the death of this guy so people will actually uh, try to save him, so a protection, the centralized protection mark, or uh, let's uh, make a bet in order to people uh, free Ross Ulbricht from jail. Uh, so uh, maybe assassination market just include one specific very corner case in which the most proportionate reaction is uh, killing, which is, would probably be only proportionate against killers, uh, while a, a more general distributed decentralized uh, physical reaction market. I don't know uh, if you, if the opponents understand these que these tweaks that I can. Okay, the last time I'm going to comment on anything in that, in that realm is this. I don't doubt that people are going to die, you know, within such a system. I just think that it's a really shitty idea to do that. So it's, it's not a question of utilitarian ethics in the sense of can it work somehow, but in my ethical systems, this randomly killing people and supporting that is itself wrong. I don't care if five... I don't care if, if five politicians that are really evil are killed by the system, that doesn't make the system work. Um, so early on in the conversation we were talking about uh, problems that may have gone wrong or rather problems we can now imagine of having gone wrong in the deployment of the internet first time around in quotes. A lot of the panels here and a lot of the speakers have talked about this likened the current stage of Bitcoin to being just working out TCP IP and that we might actually be at this early stage. Um, what kind of things might we best protect ourselves with or what kind of Pro, uh, programs are currently in place to help defend this rollout of this kind of technology. Any particular warnings or flags on the road, uh, directions that we might want to avoid or particular directions we want to take? Anybody on the panel with specifics on that? I think Jorge said he was going to go in for that. Yeah, um, create what I called earlier today rock solid cockroach protocols that uh, are really hard to impossible to change and um, build them in a way that it is hard to impossible to stop people from using them. Um, that would be my suggestion. That is my hope that this is going to happen. And uh, the, the, the cryptocurrency developers that I know personally uh, have that like as the top priority. From this, uh, the whole block size debate, battle, infighting results um, exactly. Um, from that situation that you have a couple of people who just have absolute top priority to keep stuff decentralized and not let it let it uh, slip away again. Also, um, I have mentioned before that uh, cryptocurrency um, actually helps us, or the, the development of cryptocurrency and other crypto, crypto technologies actually helps us to roll back the wheel and to fix the, the mistakes that were made in the early time of the internet. Um, I, can, I can name you two. Um, uh, one is, uh, from the beginning on the internet, there was actually supposed to be a payment method somehow. From, from the early times of the web, of the HTTP protocol, there is, you know, there's this table of HTTP errors, like 404, file not found. There's one I forgot which one it is now, I think 506 is payment required. So we, we, we rolled out the internet, everybody knew that it should have a function so you can somehow make micropayments for content, um, but it was never implemented because we didn't have digital cash. And 
uh, that is one of the one of the big mistakes of the early times of the internet because that created the pressure to to find some other way to monetize content on the internet and the only outcome of that was advertising and if you advertise in interactive media you make the, the the more you know about your customer the more money you will make out of your um out of your advertisement so we actually in the early uh, days we, we built into the internet an incentivation not only for governments but also for publishers content providers whoever to survey their customers and find out about them as much as possible and to share that information and we can fix that now um, I mean there's I don't know how far the brave browser project is but where you can go like you can choose do you want to watch do you want to read this article uh, and have advertisement uh, advertising on it or are you willing to pay 3 cents which you now can send in a in a uh, micropayment transaction um, and uh, another way how we can use crypto technology to fix the mistakes that we made in the early days of the internet obviously is distributed file storage distributed um, domain systems just just totally decentralize all that stuff uh, that is right now centralized. I think an important analogy here is that in the early days we kind of missed building encryption into the core protocols and it turned out that it's very very hard to add encryption later and I think right now in terms of digital currencies what's extremely important is to build in true anonymity in there because that's a feature if you don't build true anonymity into a system from the very beginning, you cannot add it later. And in my opinion, that's extremely important. Otherwise, you will have these you know, companies analyzing everything, and you will also lose fungibility. And that's, in my opinion, extremely important to, to get it right now. And it's sad that David Schaum, uh, David Schaum um, wrote about this in the 80s and had tr described truly anonymous digital cash and we still don't really have it in widespread adoption. And uh, I want to add, uh, it's, this is not only about encryption, it's also about decentralization itself. So you need to make sure that your base layer is and stays decentralized. It is very easy to put centralized stuff on top of a decentralized layer and people want centralized stuff. If people want consumer protection for their payments so they can be reversed like a PayPal um, transaction and if they're willing to pay 3% for that, uh, you can build it on top. Uh, or on a side chain of a decentralized system, but it's it's impossible vice versa to have a centralized base layer and then hope to be able to build decentralized stuff on top of it. Thank you. Next question. Can I, can uh, I make another comment? I didn't okay. get a chance to. Uh, about 25 years ago, I thought of a, another interesting idea which I did absolutely nothing about. After I'd read David Chom's August 1992 article on digital cash, uh, well, a few years later they were talking about spam. What is, you know, what was the traditional problem? People were sending out emails, and I thought, well, one solution would be is to effectively give the sender an opportunity to attach a tiny bit of dollars to their email, and. Well, your browser could prioritize email. Did the guy send enough uh, digital cash? If so, you might be interested in reading. If somebody's willing to attach a dollar's worth of digital cash to your email, it might be considered fairly important. If they weren't willing to put anything at all, it's probably not important. Now, you might put in exceptions so that your mother can email you without actually paying, or you know, automatically re-forward the money back. But, you know, I wish somebody had implemented something like that because uh, it does exist. All right, well, I, hey, I thought of it, but I just never did anything with it. By the way, there is a centralized service for that. It's called 21.co. Uh, so you can pay Bitcoin, you can motivate people to uh, buy Bitcoins to read their emails but centralized by provided by some company. Uh, next question. Um, just a quick quote, Brave Browser is great. I use it on Android, Brave Browser, you mentioned um, 
I'm not sure where you're looking. I'm here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, in terms of the cash on the email, you create exclusivity based on that. Like you got to just just uh, understand that you know not everyone has money to attach to certain emails. Information should be freely available and distributed freely. Um, if you do that, you prioritize and exclusive. Uh, you create exclu exclusivity clubs, which is not a very good idea. But anyways, oh. moving past that point, um, I wanted just to comment on the model that you propose with empathy. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to come at you with kind of saying it's silly, it's stupid. Um, am, I, am I correct to assume that you believe the death penalty in America is effective? Do you believe it's just? Because you well, made, I don't. No, no, I wasn't speaking to you. I was just speaking to Americans. Yeah. Americans yeah. Because answer. Because you made a comment on it before. You said, you, you know, you guys in Europe uh, feel you're very, I don't know, you, you made a comment. Yeah. It's certainly not just as is, as it is currently implemented. It's it's rare, it, is, it takes a long time, and yes, it does fail to deter uh, a lot of actions. So no, I don't consider it just as a, as a system. But it's because of who or what implements it, okay. a government organization, otherwise known as, a, in this case, a court. That's the flaw in the system. Okay. Um, pretty much, I guess, to compare it with you, uh, I'm not sure how well-traveled you are or how cultured you are in terms of other countries and their systems. Um, I'm not going to assume any of those uh, aspects. But, for example, in Norway or Sweden, they have a very different approach to crime. Um, in Sweden, they actually want to know why the person committed the crime, what went wrong in the system, what went wrong for them to do this crime. Um, in Norway, for example, even in maximum security prisons, the prisoners have a key to the, the room. They can leave, but they can go out. Um, this kind of ability to treat another human being in a humane way allows them to learn their mistakes. And they did an interview with a few of them and said, wow, you have a knife, you can cook. Like, it was uh, the, uh, Steven, no, I forget the guy's name, but anyways. Um, Where Do We Invade Next, I think, is the name of the documentary or movie. Um, and the, the prisoner said, look, uh, if you treat me inhumane, like for example they do in America, they drag you through, they treat you like an animal, I will never learn what it is to not be any different from that animal. Um, but if you take me and you give me this sort of uh, respect and uh, allow me to rehabit rehabilitate myself through the process, I will understand what it is that I did wrong. And just the fact that I have been removed from society enables me to learn. So for me, this is a more holistic approach in conditioning someone to understand uh, what it is that they did wrong, rather than go straight out and be like, well, you did something wrong, we've got to straight out kill you, because you're never going to learn. Um, so my question is like, you know, America already goes in and assassinate Assad. Like, let's go after Assad. Let's go after, you know, uh, 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 let's go after Osama bin Laden. Let's go after Saddam Hussein and all these people. I can't see how this model would be any different. I mean, for me, I just want to live in a world where surely in the years that you've published it, you know, I'm still surprised that you, it hasn't progressed that, that sort of approach. Um, I just want to know, like, well, why is this the only way that you can see it working, you know? Why, why can't it be different? Well, if the, you ask the question, why hasn't it progressed, I, I myself don't really understand why it hasn't progressed. It seems to me that at the very least people have a responsibility to either uh, agree that my idea will work or show why it won't work or alternatively provide an alternative system that will work better. People don't tend to do that and believe me I've been talking to people in 20, for 22 years on the subject. They say things like, well I just don't like that, that looks awful, it's icky, uh, it just makes me so uncomfortable. Well, remember what, I don't know whether you heard me when I was at my, my presentation, in the 20th century, governments killed 260 million people. Is that awful? Is there anybody who thinks that isn't awful? Is it, would anybody be willing to raise their hand and say, that's not awful? No, it is awful. Well, if you don't like that, then you, you are obligated, I think, morally speaking, to either 
invent your own solution or consider all proposed plausible solutions and at least determine whether or not they'll work and then decide whether or not to adopt it. If you think killing 260 million people in 100 years is bad, by killing by government, then don't just sit around and say, we can't do anything about it. That's just the way it is. No, say, does anybody have a serious solution to this? And if the person has a serious solution, analyze it to death. Hundreds of people should have written scientific and sociological papers about my AP proposal. Okay? We have a problem. Nuclear weapons. We have military spending. Why don't we analyze this and decide not just whether we like it, but whether it will actually work, and if there's something better, choose it. But I don't see that. I haven't seen people analyze. Thank you, and we have the definitely the last question. Uh, I guess it's a bit of a follow-up question to this one. Um, what I don't understand, because I haven't, and I haven't heard it being mentioned today, is uh, a plan of action about what happens. Sorry. Microphone. Okay. Put so what I haven't heard being mentioned today about this whole um, assassination politics is what happens afterwards. What's the plan of action in the past when uh, leaders have been removed uh, from their power? There's a power vacuum, and often that hasn't gone very well. Well. Revolutions historically have done poorly. Why? Because you replace one dictator with another. Okay? It's hard to avoid, or historically it's been hard to avoid. You get rid of one bad person, you get rid of, canonically, the Tsar of Russia. What do you get? You get Lenin. Uh, and I don't know whether Lenin himself was all that bad, but he died, and who do you get? <laughs> Stalin. Uh, that's like from you know from the fi frying pan into the fire. You're not really improving things very much. If I knew more about history, I would be able to quote dozens or hundreds of examples of of one kind of bad person being replaced by another kind of bad person. Okay, the, it's not enough to get rid of one bad person. You have to make sure that the next bad person is deterred from taking power. Once you have that system set up properly, you don't have this example of one bad person being replaced by another. It's very important. All prior revolutions, well, the large majority of which weren't successful because of that effect. Some revolutions occasionally work. Uh, 1989 in Eastern Europe was a shining example. But it worked because a very small number of people who were powerful decided to stop doing what they'd been doing for 30, 40 years. And that, that in itself was a miracle, but that kind of miracle doesn't happen very often. Uh, So, Smuggler, Frank, Jim, Paul, York, thank you a lot for coming here, for joining the discussion. And also,